Hello, I'm Jory and Murray, and welcome to Good Things Happen, the show that invites change makers and enablers to share their inspiring stories of progress. Whilst change can be uncomfortable, unexpected, and at times disruptive, it's inevitable, and more often than not, change is for good. We'll be hearing from people from all walks of life who have been at the forefront of change, including their journeys to get there and their motivations. Because when people work together for a common cause, good things happen. It's not through a lack of belief or talent. It's access to opportunities that is their biggest barrier. I didn't know you could do research in a bank. I didn't know I could be sitting here writing about climate change or quantum computing. Having true diversity of experiences brings more innovation and sound decision making. Talent is everywhere, but all too often opportunity isn't. The futures of far too many young people are determined by background, not potential. To explore the topic of social mobility, today I'm joined by the CEO of Progress Together, Sophie Holm, and Takumbo Ajasa Olua, who holds the same position at Career Ready, two UK organisations that focus on opening doors to careers in finance and banking. And joining Sophie and Tukumbo, we have Andrew Pitt, City's Global Head of Research and Insight. We'll start, as always, by hearing our guests' stories. Sophie, tell us about your background. How did you come to do the work that you're doing today? An interesting story. As CEO of Progress Together, we're a membership body. We aim to level up the UK financial services sector. And I've always been really interested in supporting people with their careers, getting into jobs and progressing within their jobs. And that's absolutely what we focus on at at Progress Together. So when I was five, if I think about the games that I used to play as a child, I used to play recruitment agents with my best friend. I was the recruitment agent. My friend was the secretary and she used to bring me the candidates and I'd find them jobs. I don't know any other five-year-olds that used to play that as their main game in life. Um, And so it's quite amusing to me, I think now 40 odd years later, Uh, that the job I'm doing now is supporting people to progress within their careers. I used to be head of skills policy at the City of London Corporation. I was the architect and founder of a government commission task force looking at how do we boost socioeconomic diversity at senior levels within financial and professional services. One of the outputs of of that task force was was progress together, which I'm I'm now leading. Um, But it's always been a passion for me in terms of social mobility. My dad is a a working class East Londoner. My mum uh, is the daughter of um, of immigrants that were refugees. Uh, so it, this is very close to, to my heart when I talk about social mobility. Sophie, that was my favourite answer to that question ever. To come both, same question to you. How, how does one get to the role that you, you're fulfilling now? So my background, I trained as a journalist, worked in the trade for about a decade or so. Uh, journalism media is, is uh, notoriously a very challenging industry to get into, it requires resource privilege, and I experienced that firsthand. Um, whilst working in that industry, I was introduced to the world of social enterprise, which led to me setting up a social enterprise called Catch 22 that was designed to support young people, uh, young, talented individuals that didn't have the privilege of an aunt or uncle that worked for The Economist but had an amazing level of talent and what they needed was a bridge into the industry. So from there, it really led to finding different ways of empowering young talent that either didn't have the resource, didn't have the network or didn't have the the agency to realize their potential. And really working at Career Ready for the last four years really reflects and epitomizes that that kind of purpose-driven career path I've had, which is all about empowering talent to realise their potential. Andrew, were you always drawn to research and learning? Well, as a kid growing up, I wanted to be a, a historian. I was told I learnt the sort of the regnal dates of all the kings and queens of England when I was I was four years old. So I almost became an academic historian. Uh, I actually taught at university before I got into into financial services. Um, but I've been in a career a career of research, um, and uh, as you mentioned, I, I run uh, research services for City. Um, but part of that, and this is a great privilege, is I actually run um, a public research series. We call it City GPS, City Global Perspectives and Solutions. I set that up over a decade ago to try and 
tackle some of the really big issues of the 21st century. And really, since the get-go, we've focused very much on social economics as a key area. So over the last 10 years, we've written a lot on uh, gender economics, the position of women in the economy, race equality, income inequality, um, and more latterly, really come to focus on social mobility. But one other thing I think it's important to say is we don't just produce boring research um, that hopefully a few people read. You know, we produce uh, a platform, hopefully as well, where we can bring people together. You know, to try and solve some challenges, to work together, uh, and to and to genuinely um, hope that we can make the world a better place. Wonderful, Sophie. Tell us, tell us about progress together. Tell us about the work that you do and where the focus lies. So Progress Together is a, a membership body. We are effectively a, a safe space for UK financial services firms to collaborate with each other, share best practice around what works and importantly, what doesn't work in terms of boosting socioeconomic diversity. We are particularly interested in the progression and senior level piece. So how do we get people past that middle management uh, rank from uh, working class backgrounds? Because the, the data is showing us that there's a huge amount of people from different socioeconomic backgrounds get into financial services, but actually very few make them up past the, past the middle rank, as I say. Uh, and uh, we now have 30% of the financial services workforce within our membership, and I'm delighted that, that City is one of them. And have you got success stories to share, or are you still trying to change behaviours? Yeah, so in terms of socioeconomic diversity, we've got a long mountain to climb, frankly. So uh, a couple of years ago, there was a piece of research developed by the Bridge Group that showed that 89% of senior leaders come from a higher socioeconomic background, and that compared to 47% at junior levels. But if we look at UK CEOs across the economy, different sectors, it's only 52% of CEOs are from a higher socioeconomic background. So financial services is massively out of the rest of the economy. Uh, but there's good reason for firms to be taking action on this. And actually, I was listening to a podcast, This Is Money, with Steph McGovern and, and Robert Peston recently. And they said that actually uh, changing uh, the, the diversity of the workforce at senior levels, embracing socioeconomic diversity will support productivity, uh, not just within this sector, but uh, across the UK. And firms are beginning to, to wake up to that. We're still quite new as an organisation. Uh, we've only been for a year and a half, so we're delighted that over 40 organisations have, have joined us and want to take part in this. The successes so far are that firms are starting to collect data on socioeconomic uh, backgrounds of their workforce. A couple of years ago, that was unheard of for many employers. So our success is the fact that the, the sector is coming along with us on this journey. Lovely. Tukumbo, tell us about Career Ready. So Career Ready is a charity that's been going 22 years. We work right across the UK. And essentially, we connect young talent to employers from a spectrum of different industries. And the objective is really to help them realise what is possible by introducing them to job titles, um, industries and careers that they may not know exist. Uh, and that's because they have limited access to the networks, limited social capital. But other premises, we believe they have uh, abundance of potential. So through connecting them with mentors, um, a masterclass experience where employers from our uh, partners deliver workshops with them, and then paid internships in those businesses really give thousands of young people up and down the country that aha moment where they actually realize that this is something I didn't know that I could actually do, that I have real joy and passion for. Um, and for us, it's great. And the return on that investment is not only are we providing fantastic opportunities for the young people, but also the businesses that we work with um, see a benefit. And I think one statistic that jumps out at me that really shows the proof in the pudding is after a four-week paid internship in the summer at the businesses, 81% of our employer partners said that the intern not only added value to their team, but they would employ them given the chance. So for us, that's real uh, a real big tick in the box in regards to the idea of young people with this background facing these challenges, can they thrive and survive in some of the most demanding working environments? And, and the answer is an absolute yes. 
resounding yes. And how about the candidates themselves? It must be daunting for them. Are there equal figures as they come out that they want to pursue these kind of careers? Yeah, so we recently surveyed our alumni community uh, and over half, over 50% are employed. Uh, of that 50% that are employed, at least 20% are employed by our existing employer partners. Uh, so for us, I think another statistic that really jumps out to me is post the internship, 42% of those young people have changed their mind about what they want to do for their career, which is absolutely brilliant. And for us, being able to see the long-term impact as well as the short-term impact is phenomenal. Many of those young people stay in touch with their mentors and have a long-term relationship. And and that's what that social capital piece comes about, where their network grows and they're able to realise you know, what is possible for tomorrow. And can you tell us about someone who's really inspired you? An individual that I worked with when I ran my social enterprise called uh, Catch22, which was all about training talent in the media industry. I met this individual when they were couch surfing uh, on their sister's flat in, in a flat in Camden, originally from Birmingham. I'd studied media at university and had applied for 108 jobs and didn't get one. And they were on the cusp of uh, literally giving up, essentially, on the industry. And then they met us. And for me, I could see from the very first day this, this individual had immense talent and, and huge potential, but lacked the opportunity. So working with us 14 weeks, uh, the training program lasted for 14 weeks. They produced the magazine. And then following that, they had nine months of paid internships. And the deal that we had with the industry is any young person you met that you liked, you could keep. So at one month, he was working at the Daily Mirror, then he went to The Economist, then he was at the Metro, and the Metro kept him. And 10 years later, he's now a senior editor at at the publication, uh, and he's opening the door for a plethora of other young people that have similar backgrounds to him, uh, and talented, frustrated realities. But being able to make that, um, you know, change that narrative is something that is really powerful and it's something that makes me very proud to see that the acorn of a frustrated young person couch surfing in Camden to now being one of the most senior editors in 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 a UK-wide publication is is fantastic. That's wonderful to hear. Um, uh, Andrew, why does City get involved in uh, with organizations like this? What's what's in it for a, a global bank? I think and there's an enormous amount that, that's in it for, for a global bank. And um, I think genuinely, all the people I've been involved in uh, with City over the years have had a real passion for supporting young kids on their journey. So there's a lot of people that genuinely get involved with this within the bank because they really care. We do as an employer care very much about mobility. And, um, and one of the things we show in our research is if you look at what all UK employers uh, are doing on this, some are doing nothing, some are doing a lot, but there tend to be sort of two or three main things that you can do, and one of which is partnering with outside agencies uh, to bring in young talent and young sort of under, underrepresented talent. So, you know, over the years, we've chosen Career Ready as a core partner. I think, I think to Kumbo, we had about 60 of your cohort in in the 2023 program. I had two in my department, which was fantastic. Um, they had a great time. Um, they actually realized I didn't know you could do research in a bank. I didn't know I could be sitting here writing about climate change or quantum computing. This actually seems like a quite, quite a good job. And also we have a, um, an apprenticeship program at City as a lot of large employers do. So actually we're capable of, um, you know, if, you know, folks that come through career ready want to come back for work to work for us and we have jobs, we actually have an apprenticeship route as well as the more traditional, perhaps more daunting and graduate recruitment program as well um but you know we've taken graduates um on the grad program through career ready as well which is which has been absolutely fantastic let's uh let's talk more about the term social mobility sophie do you do you have a definition of what that means and the scope of it sure so we think about socioeconomic status it's it's where we currently are in terms of um our socioeconomic background Uh, Now, you can be socially mobile, which means you go from from one socioeconomic status to another. uh, And that can be intragenerational or uh, intergenerational, depending on what you choose. Now, as uh, a membership organisation, we always encourage our members to collect data on parental occupation at 14. So what was the job of your the main household earner uh, when you were age 14? 
And then if they were in a professional uh, occupation, then you have a a professional background, a higher socioeconomic background. If they were a tradesperson, for example, they would be working class. And if you then move into having a professional role, uh, that is social mobility. So you're moving from one socioeconomic status uh, to another. Um, And for us, we are, uh, we look specifically at socioeconomic diversity. And so we are not saying that there is one class that is better than another to be within the workforce. What we're really championing is that there is a diverse range of backgrounds and experiences, especially at the senior level where the decisions are being made, because having true diversity of experiences brings more innovation and sound decision making. So yes, social mobility is important, but for us as an organisation, we're particularly focused on ensuring there are different voices around the table at the senior level table. We'll come back to that in a bit for broader discussion. Um, to Kumbo, I'm interested in insight from the individuals that you work with. Uh, uh, not only are there barriers to organisations to maybe broadening their minds, but uh, are, are there barriers with the individuals that you work with? So for many of the young people that we work with, not only are they some of the most resilient individuals of their generation and community. They're also pioneers of their communities because they're coming from backgrounds where none of their family or community may have a professional background. And they're going home, say, after working at a day at Citibank and talking about a plethora of different opportunities that they got exposed to in that day. And that could be, the response to that could be positive or the response to that could be challenging. I remember visiting one of our services up in the Northeast. There was a young person that the response they got from their parent was, is this gonna compromise my benefits that I I have? And this young person came from a family that had generations of worklessness. So there are many barriers, uh, that hidden barriers that the young people that we support are facing. But this is why we celebrate them and try and platform them as much as possible, because despite all of those barriers, not only do they still show up, but they're thriving. So, uh, you know, something like the pandemic, the digital divide was, was, was rife. Many of the young people, once we transformed our program into a digital only experience, they were delivering in, in environments that weren't conducive. You're talking about families where they were sharing one device between six individuals. On a, on a data bundle plan that wasn't reliable, but they still showed up and they still persevered and they still completed their program. So this is why we are so passionate about supporting this community of young people because it's not through a lack of belief or talent, it's access to opportunities that, that is their biggest barrier. Andrew, this isn't just about individuals and it's not just about the organisations themselves. I'm sure this has a ripple effect to society as a whole and a benefit to society as a whole. Yeah, look, look, look very much. If you look societally, um, there's a lot of evidence that shows that if you create more equality in society, you improve social cohesion, uh, you improve you know, physical and mental health outcomes, you improve crime outcomes. And people generally have a lot more sort of sense of purpose. You know, you can demonstrate quite clearly that societies that have um, lower levels of inequality actually have much better intragenerational um, job elasticity. People do progress. Social mobility happens faster. You can actually demonstrate that you can actually grow GDP quite successfully if the workforce um, skill matching is much better. Because I think one of the things that you have without good social mobility is you have a bad skill match, basically. You've got a huge amount of talent that's either underemployed or in, employed in just, in just the wrong areas of the of the economy. Um, there are some pretty big claims out there, but you are probably talking in the realm of sort of 5 to 10% of, of a nation's GDP can be increased theoretically if you have a much more mobile uh, much more mobile labor force. And we generally, we get better employee engagement rates, which, which over time you know, lead to lower staff turnover ratios, which again ripple back into your, you know, into, into your earnings as a company. But I think the main thing to... Uh, to get over to people from the data is whatever your motivations for supporting mobility, um, it's actually good business as well. Sophie, anything to add to that? This is about innovation and the cost of wasted talent. If you have got high performers coming into the organisation and they are not rising to the top despite their performance um, and they're performing really well, um, that's a a risk to the organisation. 
Um, and we know from evidence that employees working class backgrounds progress 25% slower than peers with no link to job performance. So there is a huge cost of wasted talent here, uh, and that's a real risk to, to, to organisations. To come, though, I can see you nodding furiously in agreement. I think I think the progress is, is being able to support businesses to think differently, to be courageous when it comes to addressing the, the notion of uh, talent acquisition. So working alongside a, a number of different industries We've seen them take the brave steps of realizing that entry-level talent can come from a number of different income um, generation factors. But through working with a charity like us or one of their other social mobility partners, they've been able to use that as almost like a, a test bed for talent to reduce the level of risk associated with um, individuals that haven't gone through more traditional routes of, of labor. So. I've noticed a number of our partners, to Andrew's point, um, increasing uh, apprenticeship schemes or other entry-level schemes that would never have been considered before because they've seen the benefits of that, whether it's through um, employing talent that may have gone on to higher education and then come back and return to that business. And it's a business that that young person probably didn't know of at the age of 16 and they were exposed to through that paid internship. So for us, it's, it's, it's a win-win um, development that I've seen. Businesses being more brave, more courageous, uh, and innovative in when it comes to talent acquisition. And at the same time, young people realizing that they have that self-esteem and also having older individuals that have been through that journey from their backgrounds that have come back to the program and even become mentors because we've been going over two decades. So that connectivity is really unique and very powerful as well, where that whole saying of seeing it and, and, and believing it is, is something that comes true. Yeah, no, Julian, I was going to actually say to, to back up what uh, Takumbo's saying there. Um, I mean, we've been working with Career Eddy for a long time, so we can actually see the benefits of, of what's happened to the students that have come through that program. You know, a number of them are, are working for Citigroup today very, very successfully. But it's it's absolutely, it's spawned other things that we've done. It's made us rethink how we can um, get more out of the apprenticeship levy and what we do with that. Um, we actually started another program, our own program, um, last summer. It was a pilot program. It's been very successful, so we're going to carry on, which was basically a a program to attract university students in their first year, end of their first year, to come for um, internships, which are mostly virtual. You get one day in the office, but to make it easy for them, it was mostly online. It was quite a big commitment. It was over 30 hours uh, of online sessions the students had to sign up to. Um, and it was a student cohort that came from uh, you know, more disadvantaged backgrounds, so using sort of classic social mobility screening. I think we had just under 30 students on the program last year. We've now taken half of them back as full interns this summer. Now, that's, you know, it's a small step. It's a very important step, but probably wouldn't have happened had we not already been working with Takumbo's team and the Career Ready organization to sort of see some of the benefits of this. One thing that we're doing on the back of the research that we, uh, uh, we published last year is running a continued series of workshops with other corporates um, that like what we're doing. So this is talking to corporates in the industrial sector, the consumer sector, as, as well as other banks. I'm seeing momentum. Um, I, I, hope it, I hope it continues. We probably do need support from other areas, from the government, from the economic environment and so on. But I, I'm, I'm certainly feeling some optimism here. Sophie, we've talked about the positive steps we've seen. Um, give us a sense of how far we need to go, particularly in the area the progress together is working. So in terms of the progression piece, um, like I said, we've, we've got now got 30% of the financial services sector within our membership and really pushing hard to progress talent from, from working class backgrounds, which is fantastic. There is a long way to go because what we're working towards is parity. We want the senior levels to represent the socioeconomic diversity across the workforce. And the first step is obviously collecting that data and know your starting point, which is great. But to get there, there's a lot in between to get from A to B. There is a huge need for role modelling, but also to be accountable for change. The role modelling is, is really key. And, and if I can, I was, I was reflecting on a, uh, an interview that I had in my 20s. Uh, and the interviewer said to me, 
uh, you know, noticed on my CV I'd been to the univers- university in Bristol and said, oh, I went to the University of Bristol as well. I hadn't. I'd been to an ex-poly in Bristol. Um, at that moment, I felt that level of shame and I didn't say anything. And I hadn't lied on my CV, but I didn't fess up in that interview. And I just kind of went, oh, OK, um, and kind of moved on to the next question. Um, and I got the job, by the way. Uh, but the, a couple of years later, I bumped into the chair of that organisation and it turned out that he had been to an ex-poly as well. And he was talking to some school students about his career journey. And it was at that moment that I thought, OK, I don't need to feel the shame of where I've come from. I can too get to the level of seniority that, that he has. And, and now I'm obviously a CEO of an organisation. But back then, I just immediately ruled myself out thinking I didn't have the educational standing. And it's really important that leaders talk about their experiences because socioeconomic background is that hidden characteristic. We change our accents, uh, we hide those experiences, we pretend we know about skiing holidays when we haven't been on one. Um, and, and what we're really calling for is leaders to, to stand up and, and, uh, and, and be visible in terms of their range of backgrounds that they have. Um, to come though, uh, same question to you really, uh, have we just scratched the surface so far? How, how, how far do we need to go? Yeah, I think we, we've definitely just scratched the surface. I mean, when I uh, we did some work where we were reviewing the Global Social Mobility Index and the top five nations were definitely not, UK wasn't in the top five. I think top five were Scandinavian nations. And I think in UK scored maybe 21st or 27th. Um, and then the States was below that. So I think in the context of what is possible, and, and kind of similar to the, the trait that City are doing where they're sharing their experiences uh, in a collaborative manner, the UK as a nation um, needs to be exploring what, what does it take to be in the top five nations in, in the world? Because we, we have the, the perception that, you know, a leading developed nation, but when it comes to social mobility, the fact that we're somewhere in the 20s is it doesn't align for me. The work that we do to tackle social mobility or increase positive social mobility is much bigger task than any charity can achieve on its own. So it's going to require a level of, of collaboration, not just through the private and third sector, but also government as well. It's interesting. Uh, Scandinavia always seems to be at the top of these uh, indices and I think they're the top three of the happiness index as well. And I'm sure all of these things are interconnected, just happier societies, more mobile societies. Um, a- Andrew, a- any more insight from your report uh, about what there still needs to be done? Well, look, I think a lot needs to be done. And, and um, I, I wouldn't want to be falsely optimistic. I think from a government perspective, um, I mean, probably some... Quite simple, blunt things would be ha- would be useful. Sophie would probably applaud this. I mean, if there was a mandatory requirement to try and maintain data on mobility, I think that would help speed things up. Um, as there is a mandatory reporting on on other issues around sort of gender or or, or, uh, or ethnicity, ethnicity. Um, a little micro sort of you know hand up from from us at City is I think I wish the UK government was a little bit more flexible with the use of the apprenticeship levy, um, you know, which is which is applied to all employers with more than a three million pound payroll um we have to take i think 0.5 of a percent of payroll and invest it back in apprenticeship programs which is great and we do that but actually you're quite restricted if we can if we could be more creative with that if we could actually take some of that money and do much more with Tukumbo would be would be a great thing to be able to do so there's some little tweaks i think are quite are quite easy um there are bigger issues that cause these inequalities though it's sort of inequalities of health infrastructure education uh, and we know that it's a tough you know macro environment at the moment so you know, there are things there that the governments uh, need to work on. My last question to each of you is uh, what can listeners do to help, be they uh, clients of City, be they employees, colleagues of Andrew at City, or people maybe thinking about wanting to get in the world of finance? Uh, what, what would you encourage listeners to do obviously if you work for a financial services organization join progress together be part of the the network and push for change um if you have leverage with the regulators push for change as well to andrew's point we absolutely 
uh, a call in very hard for uh, the regulators and financial services to mandate collection and reporting on socioeconomic background um, and to apply a little bit of pressure if you are an investor uh, or a client of organisations, find out uh, what their socioeconomic diversity is. Um, and, and also looking at all the way through the, the pipeline, I'm nervous about setting people up to fail. Yes, there is a huge diversity of, of females at the bottom um, rung, people from working class backgrounds, ethnic minorities. Um, but unless we really see whether they're tracking up through the organisation, we are ultimately setting them up to fail because they're not given the opportunities to move up should they want to. Um, and interventions that we recommend around socioeconomic diversity, things like having transparent processes around work allocation or transparent uh, kind of access to senior sponsors and uh, transparent processes around promotion, that works for socioeconomic diversity as it does for ethnicity, as it does for, for gender. If we get these interventions right, it will have a bigger impact on the whole organisation and across the DNI space, not just the socioeconomic piece. Yeah, I guess it must be, well, it must be heartening for you to, when you heard that City was a, a global bank that gave the top job to a woman. She's doing a great job. Absolutely. More of it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to Kumbo, um, messages to anybody who might be listening. Yeah, I, I think I'll take it on a really practical level. I think if this is something that you are interested in, then giving up your time, uh, a, an hour a month as a mentor is, is something that's really powerful and really important. If you're a business owner or you know a decision maker within an organization, finding a resource to host an internship could change a young person's life and add value to your business. We can talk about this as much as we want. But it's the little incremental actions that we we are empowered to take that that will make the difference. So yeah, I think giving up your time, uh, giving up accessibility to to talent of tomorrow, and also finding a resource to to host paid internships can can be life changing. Andrew, same question to you. Our City GPS report. You can access it by literally just going into a search bar, typing City GPS, and then then social mobility, and it's it's free to download. Um, it is a quality uh, piece of analysis, and I think the use that it has is probably threefold. So it's a very easy one-stop shop for anyone who knows very little about this to understand the topic and see how it varies uh, across countries and see why the Nordic countries are good at this, uh, to some of our earlier comments. Also in the research is a toolkit um, if you are an employer for what we for what we think works and explain some of the things we're uh, we're trying to do at City and any students that, that are listening um, you know, before um, the stage of, of applying for jobs, don't be afraid to apply. You know, please, you know, have those aspirations. Um, you'll find that certainly, um, you know, places like City, you know, are are good places to come to. That's a lovely place to finish. Sophie, Tukumbo, Andrew, thank you so much for giving up your time. I've really enjoyed this conversation and congratulations on the work that you're doing. On the next episode of Good Things Happen, UK para triathlete and gold medalist Lauren Stedman joins us alongside City's Head of Early Career Talent Acquisition, Ingrid Giordano, to talk about para sport and how City sponsorship has enabled athletes and their membership organisations to grow. City Group Inc., Career Ready and Progress Together are not affiliated and are independent companies. Career Ready and Progress Together have a relationship with City through City Global Insights. The speaker's views are their own and may not necessarily reflect the views of City or any of its affiliates. 